According to Joseph Smith, when he was 14 years old, his community of Palmyra, New York, experienced a religious revival, and his mother and three older siblings joined the Presbyterian Church. But he remained undecided about which church was true and which he should join. At length, he decided to ask God for guidance and went into the woods to pray on the morning of a beautiful clear day early in the spring of 1820. As he described it in his official history, which he began dictating in 1838, I kneeled down and began to offer up the desires of my heart to God. I had scarcely done so, when immediately I was seized upon by some power which entirely overcame me, and had such an astonishing influence over me, as to bind my tongue so that I could not speak. Thick darkness gathered around me, and it seemed to me, for a time, as if I were doomed to sudden destruction. Just at this moment of great alarm, I saw a pillar of light exactly over my head, above the brightness of the sun, which descended gradually until it fell upon me. It no sooner appeared than I found myself delivered from the enemy which held me bound. When the light rested upon me, I saw two personages, whose brightness and glory defy all description, standing above me in the air. One of them spake unto me, calling me by name, and said, pointing to the other, This is my beloved son, hear him. My object in going to inquire of the Lord was to know which of all the sects was right, that I might know which to join. No sooner, therefore, did I get possession of myself, so as to be able to speak, then I asked the personages who stood above me in the light which of all the sects was right, and which I should join. I was answered that I must join none of them, for they were all wrong, and all their creeds were an abomination in his sight, that those professors were all corrupt. They draw near to me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They teach for the doctrines the commandments of men, having a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof. He again forbade me to join with any of them, and many other things did he say unto me, which I cannot write at this time. When I came to myself again, I found myself lying on my back, looking up into heaven. Hi, I'm Dan Vogel. Prior to publication of Joseph Smith's official history in 1842, very few Mormons had even heard about Joseph Smith's 1820 vision of deity. So, it is with some irony that it is now considered the foundational event of the Mormon Restoration. In recent decades, the first vision has created no small stir and division amongst students of early Mormon history, with critics on one side pointing to contradictions and anachronisms as evidence that the vision was a later invention, and apologists on the other side creating clever arguments designed to explain away the problems. In this three-part video, I will discuss these debates, and while I might side with the critics, I want to push beyond simply identifying contradictions and anachronisms and explore the historical implications of that evidence, with the view of uncovering the core story and the possible event in Joseph Smith's life upon which the first vision story may have been based. Even before the Rev. Wesley P. Walters famously raised questions about the 1820 Palmyra revival in 1967, critics challenged the vision's historicity. Given the available historical sources, critics noted that the vision seemed to pop into the historical record in 1838 without precedent. No one, not even Joseph Smith's family, mentioned the vision before he did. Why did Joseph Smith withhold such an important foundational event? They concluded it was another of Joseph Smith's fabrications. However, this approach was basically an argument from silence, and therefore vulnerable to the discovery of new sources, which Mormon apologists gladly provided. Apologists presented eight contemporary accounts of Joseph Smith's first vision, which has recently been expanded to nine as evidence that it was not a later invention and that Smith told a consistent story. 
Because our concern is the historicity of the 1838 account, number three, my examination will focus on the two accounts that precede it. Another reason is that the six accounts that follow the 1838 history are mostly reiterations or variations of that account. While the two earlier accounts established that the first vision wasn't invented in 1838, they did raise questions about the number of beings that appeared to Joseph Smith, their identities, his motivation for praying, and the content of the answer he received. To escape these problems, some apologists have attempted to harmonize the various accounts by separating the elements of the stories from their literary contexts and comparing them on a highly abstracted level. The problem with this approach is that it breaks down once the elements are placed back into their historical and literary contexts. Other apologists have tried to excuse the contradictions by blaming them on Joseph Smith's faulty memory. While the apologists try to defend Joseph Smith in any way possible, their efforts are desperate and unconvincing, as will become apparent as I proceed with my examination. Of the two accounts that preceded the 1838 narrative, the 1832 history is by far the most important because Joseph Smith wrote it himself for a specific purpose. Less polished than his later history, the 1832 account contains significant differences. Chief among the contradictions is the apparent absence of God the Father which critics were quick to exploit. In his earliest account, which was never published during his lifetime, Joseph Smith said, While in the attitude of calling upon the Lord in the sixteenth year of my age, a pillar of light above the brightness of the sun at noonday came down from above and rested upon me, and I was filled with the Spirit of God. And the Lord opened the heavens upon me, and I saw the Lord, and he spake unto me, saying, Joseph, my son, thy sins are forgiven thee. Behold, I am the Lord of glory. I was crucified for the world, that all those who believe on my name may have eternal life. Behold, the world lieth in sin at this time, and none doeth good, no, not one. They have turned aside from the gospel, and keep not my commandments. They draw near to me with their lips, while their hearts are far from me and mine anger is kindling against the inhabitants of the earth, to visit them according to their ungodliness, and to bring to pass that which has been spoken by the mouth of the prophets and apostles. Behold, and lo, I come quickly, as it is written of me in the cloud clothed in the glory of my Father. And my soul was filled with love, and for many days I could rejoice with great joy, and the Lord was with me. Needless to say, when this version of Joseph Smith's first vision first became public in the 1960s, many Mormons were quite disturbed by the absence of the Father. In 2012, Stephen C. Harper, formerly a Brigham Young University professor of church history and doctrine, and now an editor of the Joseph Smith Papers, published an apologetic book devoted solely to Joseph Smith's first vision in which he tried to explain the absence of the Father in the 1832 account by suggesting we could interpret the 1832 account to mean that Joseph saw one being who then revealed another, while referring to both beings as the Lord. The Lord opened the heavens upon me, and I saw the Lord. In Harper's reading, the 1832 account says, The Father opened the heavens upon me, and I saw the Son. The problem is, the 1832 account doesn't say Joseph Smith saw one Lord who opened the heavens and then saw another. It only states that it was the Lord who opened the heavens, which enabled Smith to see the Lord. By no stretch of the imagination are there two personages in the light. The Father is not there to introduce the Son, as later accounts claim, but the Son introduces himself saying, Joseph, my son, thy sins are forgiven thee. Behold, I am the Lord of glory. I was crucified for the world. This kind of desperate apologetics only serves to highlight the seriousness of the problem. However, 
The problem is much more complex than Harper's clumsy insertion of the father into the 1832 account can fix. Because Joseph Smith's theology hadn't evolved to the point where the father could be viewed as a separate person from the son. Therefore, the 1838 claim of seeing both the father and the son as two personages is anachronistic to the 1820 setting, since Joseph Smith's earliest theology was that Jesus is both the Father and the Son. In the context of Book of Mormon theology, where Jesus is both the Father and Son, the Father according to the Spirit and the Son according to the flesh, recognized by theologians as modalism or sabellianism, his appearing alone and calling Joseph Smith his Son makes perfect sense. Sibelius was a 3rd century heretic who held the son himself as the father, and vice versa. Modalists conceived the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost as three modes or expressions of the one God. Modalism thus differs from orthodox definitions of the Godhead in that it does not distinguish between the person of the Father and the person of the Son. In other words, the Father not only begets the Son, but becomes the Son. Jesus is literally both Son and Father. This position is also sometimes called patripassionism, because the Father in the person of the Son suffers on the cross. This view of the Godhead was somewhat prevalent in Joseph Smith's day, according to David Millard, a Christian primitivist missionary working in western New York. In 1818, he described some Trinitarians who reject the term person, and instead of this, use the term mode or office, and hold that the Trinity consists in one God, acting in three distinct offices. In his well-known book, The True Messiah, published in 1823 in Canandaigua, New York, Millard observed, A great part of the Trinitarians are now on the same ground as Sibelius, viz., that one God only acts in three distinct offices, which is direct Sabellianism. It is therefore worthy of remark how near many Trinitarians approach the old doctrine of Sabellianism. The Book of Mormon's description of the Incarnation is congruent with modalism. King Benjamin, for example, told his people about 124 BCE that the time cometh and is not far distant that with power the Lord Omnipotent who reigneth, who was and is from all eternity to all eternity, shall come down from heaven among the children of men, and shall dwell in a tabernacle of clay, and he shall be called Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Father of heaven and earth, the Creator of all things from the beginning. Other passages make it clear that Jesus is literally the Father. As a premortal spirit personage, Jesus appeared to the brother of Jared thousands of years before his birth and declared, I am he who was prepared from the foundation of the world to redeem my people. Behold, I am Jesus Christ. I am the Father and the Son. On the day before Jesus' birth, the voice of the Lord came to Nephi the third, declaring, I come to do the will both of the Father and of the Son of the Father because of me, and the Son because of my flesh. In the first part of the Book of Mormon, Nephi saw a vision of the condescension of God, and was told that the virgin which he saw was the mother of God after the manner of the flesh. When Nephi saw the virgin bearing a child in her arms, the angel declared, Behold, the Lamb of God, yea, even the Eternal Father. These passages were changed by Joseph Smith in the 1837 edition to read, The mother of the Son of God, and even the Son of the Eternal Father. The Book of Mormon expresses the literal oneness demanded by modalism. About 82 BCE, Zizram asked Nephite missionary Amulek two important questions on the nature of the Godhead. First, is there more than one God? To which Amulek answered, No. Second, Is the Son of God the very Eternal Father? To which Amulek answered, Yea, He is the very Eternal Father of heaven and earth, 
and he shall come into the world to redeem his people. About 148 BCE, the prophet Abinadi, before being martyred, explained the oneness of the Father and the Son in words that modalists would have easily understood. God himself shall come down among the children of men and shall redeem his people. And because he dwelleth in the flesh, he shall be called the Son of God. And having subjected the flesh to the will of the Father, being the Father and the Son, the Father because he was conceived by the power of God, and the Son because of the flesh, thus becoming the Father and the Son, and they are one God, yea, the very eternal Father of heaven and earth. While Abinadi clearly states that God the Father, as a spirit, comes down to earth to dwell in the flesh as the Son, to escape the implications of modalism, Mormon apologist Blake T. Osler has argued that Abinadi's statement is incompatible with modalism because it assigns separate wills for the Father and the Son, that the Son's will is subordinated to or swallowed up in the Father's will implying there are two wills. There are, indeed, two wills described in the passage, but not the wills of separate persons or personalities. Elsewhere, the Book of Mormon describes the human struggle against the will of the flesh. Second Nephi 2.29, for instance, comments on the will of the flesh and the evil which is therein. And Second Nephi 10.24 declares, Reconcile yourselves to the will of God, and not to the will of the devil and the flesh. To speak of the will of the flesh doesn't imply each human is composed of two persons or entities. Likewise, Mosiah 15 is merely describing the subjection of the will of the flesh, or son, to the will of the spirit, or father, and is therefore entirely consistent with modalism. Other apologists have tried to overcome these distinctive modalistic passages by citing other passages which contradict the oneness demanded by modalism. These other passages refer to such things as the voice of the Father introducing the Son, the Son praying to the Father, the subjection of the Son to the will of the Father, and the Son ascending to the Father. However, all these passages have parallels in the New Testament. But such passages never discouraged modalists. To call these passages anti-modalist is to beg the question. This is exactly what Ari D. Bruning and David L. Paulson did in their 2001 essay published in the Apologetic Farms Review of Books, where they noted, The ratio of anti-modalist passages to modalist passages in the first edition of the Book of Mormon is at least 20 to 1 and then argued. Hence, even if the modalist passages could not be successfully accommodated by a Trinitarian model, the existence of these six modalist passages would be far less of a difficulty to a Trinitarian model than the overwhelming preponderance of anti-modalist passages is to a modalist model. The presence of apparent contradictions, no matter how many, does not detract from a modalist interpretation. A modalist, for example, might respond that Jesus' flesh nature was praying to his divine nature, or that his references to his Father were metaphorical. No matter how difficult and unsatisfying modalist answers or interpretations might be to an Orthodox Trinitarian or even a tritheistic Mormon, the fact remains modalists have existed and still do exist even today. Since all theological positions have to explain oneness in light of passages containing implications of separateness, I would argue that priority should be given to the unique and explicit modalist passages in the Book of Mormon. For example, passages which speak of the Father sending the Son should be understood in light of Ether 4.12. He that will not believe me will not believe the Father who sent me, for behold, I am the Father. Nor do passages which speak of the Son being prepared from the foundation of the earth necessarily imply two persons existing before the Incarnation. Consider again 
The following words spoken to the brother of Jared thousands of years before Christ. I am he who was prepared from the foundation of the world to redeem my people. Behold, I am Jesus Christ. I am the Father and the Son. The Book of Mormon's modalistic view of the Godhead was brought out in an exchange of letters published in the Christian Palladium in 1837 and 1838 between Mormon elder Stephen Post and Oliver Barr, an elder of the Christian Connection. Barr, a Benetarian, thought it blasphemous to claim that God the Creator, the Eternal Father, had a mother, was a child, was born at Jerusalem, was spit upon, nailed to the cross, slain, and buried in a sepulcher. If the Father and Son are one person, Barr continued, then part of his, Post's, God is material. He concluded, the Mormon God is a complex, compound God, part matter, part spirit, and yet eternal. Some of the revelations Joseph Smith dictated between 1829 and 1831 similarly blurred the distinction between the Father and the Son. A revelation Joseph Smith dictated in September 1830 begins, Listen to the voice of Jesus Christ, your Redeemer, the Great I Am. Then later, in the same revelation, I, the Lord God, speaks of redemption through faith on the name of mine only begotten Son. Near the beginning of another revelation that Joseph Smith dictated in March 1831, the voice of deity declares, Thus saith the Lord, For I am God, and have sent mine only begotten Son into the world. Then closes the revelation by stating, Behold, I am Jesus Christ, and I come quickly. Also, about the same time, Smith revised the Bible, changing a number of passages to more explicitly identify the Son with the Father. For example, he changed Luke 10.22, in which Jesus declares, No man knoweth who the Son is but the Father, and who the Father is but the Son, and he to whom the Son will reveal him. In the revised version, Jesus is made to say, No man knoweth that the Son is the Father, and the Father is the Son, but him to whom the Son will reveal it. Several scholars have noticed a shift in the Mormon concept of God in the mid-1830s. One writer, for example, remarked that revelations Joseph Smith received after 1833 contain less crossover in the roles and titles of the Father and the Son. In fact, it appears that after May of 1833, Joseph never again referred to Jesus as the Father in any of his writings. What are commonly called the Lectures on Faith were delivered at the School of the Elders in Kirtland, Ohio during the winter of 1834-35 and were included in the Doctrine and Covenants the following September. The fifth lecture described the Godhead as consisting of two personages, the Father being a personage of spirit, the Son, who was in the bosom of the Father, a personage of tabernacle, possessing the same mind with the Father, which mind is the Holy Spirit, that bears record of the Father and the Son, and these three are one. While still sounding very much like Book of Mormon theology, the lecture made a subtle shift by never declaring Jesus was both the Father and the Son. Instead, the Father remains a personage of spirit outside the body of Jesus and enters only via the Holy Spirit, which emanates from God, and is shed forth upon all those who believe on His name and keep His commandments. Nevertheless, it appears the Son remains only a vessel for the Father's spirit, if not a spirit personage. As the lecture states, The Son possesses all the fullness of the Father, or the same fullness with the Father, being begotten of Him. The Father and Son possess the same mind, the Son being filled with the fullness of the mind of the Father, or in other words, the Spirit of the Father. Because the fifth lecture describes the Father and Son as personages, but not the Holy Spirit, some have concluded that this represents a shift to Benetarianism. However, while the lecture describes the Son as a personage of flesh, it nevertheless fails to define the Son as a person, distinct from the Father, 
and therefore may only be a variation of modalism, albeit one that would allow for the simultaneous appearance of the father and son. Sidney Rigdon, an early Mormon convert from Campbellism, helped Joseph Smith prepare the lectures, and consequently the Binitarian-like formulation of the Godhead may reflect Rigdon's primitivistic background. Nevertheless, the lectures were published, along with Joseph Smith's revelations, in the 1835 Doctrine and Covenants, and became the official teaching of the Church until they were removed in 1921. About the same time the lectures were being delivered, Joseph Smith's recitals of his first vision began to reflect the same view of the Godhead. When Smith related his experience in November 1835 to Robert Matthews, a religious eccentric, also known as Matthias the Prophet, he not only said a personage appeared in the midst of a pillar of flame, but that another personage soon appeared, like unto the first. The fifth lecture more than once mentioned that Jesus was created in the express image and likeness of the Father, which was taken from Hebrews 1.3. In such case, the 1838 account could be interpreted by readers of the lectures as follows. The Father appeared to Joseph Smith as a personage of spirit and introduced his son, a tabernacle of flesh identical in appearance, who, in the words of the lecture, was filled with the fullness of the mind of the Father, or in other words, the Spirit of the Father, and hence was not a separate person possessing his own spirit personage. In view of Joseph Smith's evolving theology, the attempt by Harper to insert the Father into the 1838 account is much more problematic than a simple and clumsy manipulation of the text can solve. Besides the absence of the Father, there are several other significant differences, even contradictions, between the 1832 and 1838 accounts. In 1838, Joseph Smith said he prayed to know which of all the sects was right, that he might know which to join. Whereas in 1832, he said he had already concluded, prior to his vision, that there was no true church on earth. In this account, Joseph said, By searching the scriptures, I found that mankind did not come unto the Lord, but that they had apostatized from the true and living faith, and there was no society or denomination that built upon the gospel of Jesus Christ, as recorded in the New Testament. Apologists have tried to smooth over this discrepancy. This can be seen most clearly in a chart published in 1970 by BYU professor James B. Allen in the church's periodical, The Improvement Era which listed the various elements of the first vision story, and there on the sixth line can be seen that all the accounts are represented as including Joseph Smith's quest to know which church, if any, was right. When this article was reprinted in expanded form in 2005 and again in 2012, Allen and his co-author John W. Welch, a professor of law at BYU and well-known apologist, altered the chart to exclude Alexander Niebuhr's 1844 account, but the 1832 history remained. In the body of the article, Allen and Welch assert, In looking at all the churches, Joseph said, I knew not who was right or who was wrong, but considered it of the first importance to me that I should be right. This burning question is, in fact, mentioned in all the accounts excepting only Niebuhr's short diary entry. This statement, of course, is incorrect as it pertains to Joseph Smith's 1832 history. While Allen and Welch made no effort to justify their inclusion of the 1832 account, retired BYU professor Richard Lloyd Anderson attempted in 2012 to argue that the contradiction between the 1832 and 1838 accounts is only superficial, since Joseph Smith could not be sure of his conclusion that all the churches were apostate, until it was confirmed by God. He further argued that although the 1832 account is silent on Joseph Smith's wanting to know which church is true, the answer Jesus gave implies that the question had been asked. In a footnote, he asserted, In fact, the 1832 account implies the same prayer question as the 1838 account, 
for the Lord's answer written in 1832 answers the question of which church is true. None doeth good, they have turned aside from my gospel. Anderson, however, missed the point Joseph Smith was trying to make in 1832, which was, given his conclusion that all the churches were apostate, where could he go for salvation? Thus he declares, Therefore I cried unto the Lord for mercy, for there was none else to whom I could go and obtain mercy. Significantly, the first words Jesus spoke in this account were, Joseph, my son, thy sins are forgiven thee. I was crucified for the world, that all those who believe on my name may have eternal life. In other words, Joseph Smith was saved despite the apostate condition of the churches. That was his answer. Jesus' declaration concerning the apostate condition of the churches merely confirmed Joseph Smith's conclusion. It didn't motivate his prayer and therefore didn't answer a question that wasn't asked. In the body of his article, Anderson referred to a statement I made and tried to argue that there really is no difference between the 1832 and 1838 accounts. Vogel doesn't want to mix the scriptural 1838 account and the simple 1832 history penned by Joseph Smith, since he thinks the latter leaves out a revival and confusion over which sect to join as motivation for praying. Instead, Vogel believes Joseph was motivated by a need for salvation and forgiveness of sins. Though some share this view, it is a distinction without a difference. Both the 1832 and 1838 accounts merge different aspects of the same thing. Of course, in both accounts, Joseph Smith is concerned about his salvation, but as previously explained, for very different reasons, which Anderson failed to consider because he didn't bother to quote my next sentence, where, speaking of the 1832 account, I said, This need for salvation posed a problem to him because he had already concluded all the sects were apostate. In other words, having concluded all the churches were false, where could he go for salvation and remission of sins? This is very different from praying to know which of all the sects was right, that I might know which to join. By failing to consider my full statement, Anderson has only argued against a straw man. Clearly, the differences between the 1832 and 1838 accounts are woven into the fabric of their individual narratives and cannot be removed and generalized in an effort to harmonize them. By so doing, Anderson and others have obscured the legitimate and important shift in Joseph Smith's first vision story. This shift is important because it means that portions of the 1838 account are anachronistic particularly the claim that he was motivated to pray because he wanted to know which church was true, which in turn means that he didn't ask which church to join, and therefore he was not commanded by one of the two divine personages to join none of them. Since in 1838 Joseph Smith claimed his confusion about which church to join was sparked by an 1820 revival in Palmyra, it is not surprising that the 1832 account has no mention of it, and that several aspects of Joseph Smith's description of that revival appear to be anachronistic as well. I hope you will join me for part two, where I will discuss Joseph Smith's claim that a great revival had motivated him to offer the prayer that resulted in his 1820 vision of deity. I'm Dan Vogel. Thanks for watching.